please welcome please guys if you can if you can hear me very loud and clear please use the chat box just so i can know that oh adriana okay so i think you you can hear me loud and clear you you answered good afternoon adriana okay good good Luana, hello. Fabiano, good afternoon. How are you guys doing? Are you okay? Vera, good afternoon. Hello, hello, Vera. Mary Anna, Gianna, Juliet, hello. Analia, hello, Sonia, Leandro, good afternoon, everybody. Wow, so many people. Oh, that is so cool. Yasmin, Yasmin from Sao Paulo. Eliane, good afternoon. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, I know it's Wednesday. It's the middle of the afternoon. And wow, you're all here. Therese and Margaret from Brasilia. Wow, good afternoon. Therese is from Brasilia. Oh, are you friends? Do you work in the same school? Therese and Margaret, if you work at the same school, that's going to be super cool. Uh, Laura, Bahia, Fabiano from Rio. Wow, so cool. It's really, really nice to have you guys uh, from all over this country. I know this country is gigantic, so yeah, so cool. Uh, Belo Horizonte, Carla. Hello, Felipe from Rio as well. Wow, so cool, so cool. Uh, so once again, guys, Thank you so much for joining. I know it's the middle of the afternoon and you guys have like tons of stuff to do, tons of lessons to prepare, maybe some essays to correct, um, uh, I don't know, maybe quizzes to, to mark. You have a lot of stuff to do in the middle of the afternoon and uh, you found time to join, uh, to join us actually here today. Really, really, really cool. Thank you so much for that. Seriously, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. And thank you, Giselle, again for, for, for this invitation. It's been a while. Giselle and I, we have, we've had a very, a very interesting bond. We, we bonded. And uh, since ever since the pandemic started, I was focused more on online things. So uh, we kind of like, oh, okay, so... Uh, Giselle's doing their things. I was doing my own thing. And now we're back here. Uh, thank you, Giselle, for this opportunity once again. Now online, it's not face-to-face, -face, but online. Thank you so much. And guys, before we actually get things going, I'm going to post here in the chat box all my connections, okay? So you can find me here on Facebook. Oh, there's a typo there. There's a no missing. Uh, you can find me on Machelo Consultoria or my own account, Rodolfo Matiello, uh, Instagram, at Matiello Consultoria, you can find me there as well. You can find me on YouTube, yes. Uh, all you got to do is search for Matiello Consultoria. There are so many videos on YouTube, on my YouTube channel. And you can also find me on Spotify because a good friend of mine, Andre Hedlund, and I, we have kind of like a podcast, and uh, it's on Spotify as well. It's also on YouTube. It's also on Instagram. And you can also find it on Spotify, but without images. So you can find me uh, in all of these places. All right, guys. So without further ado, let's get things up and running. Let me just share my screen with you guys. <clears throat> all right, guys, just give me a feedback. Oh, Alina, you're from Campinas. So, oh, all right. That's so cool. I'm from Campinas as well. Um, so, guys, can you see my slide? Is everything okay? Just give me uh, give me a signal on the chat box, please. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. <clears throat> all right, guys. So, um, we're going to talk about, for the next 60 minutes, we're going to talk about uh, the mind and brain aspects of language acquisition, right? Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, I'm a cognitive linguist. I have a master's degree in applied linguistics, and I've been working as an English teacher for quite some time. I don't want to say it. It makes my, 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 my heart break every time I say, but I've been working as an English teacher for over 20 years. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say it out loud. Okay, guys, 20 years, over 20 years. 
So um, that's why I decided when Giselle invited me to have a conversation with you guys, I said, oh, okay, so maybe this is going to be um, super cool, a super cool topic because especially, well, first, because it's my um, area of study and also because it's part of one of my cursus just in some, I'm a professor for uh, PUC Paraná, and I have a cursus just in some on uh, cognitive grammar, and I'm also a postgrad professor for PUC Paraná on bilingualism. And of course, there are a lot of aspects on uh, this conversation today that I use in both my courses, cursus just in some, and also on at my um, Postgrad course. All right, guys. So, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about some notions of usage-based learning and debunk a couple of things as language as language teachers. We're also going to talk about grammar construction. Okay, and finally, we're going to wrap up talking about second language acquisition and classroom practices or uh, classroom use. All right, guys. Uh, and oh yeah, something very important. Uh, if you do have questions, you can use the chat box here because, and please um, use the question mark because then we have um, we all the questions you type on the chat box with a question mark and all these things, they are going directly to the Q and A part of the box. If I'm not wrong, oh, actually no, there is a Q and A part in the chat box. You can use the Q and A to ask me questions. Um, of course, I'm going to save some time for Q&A for some interaction, but go ahead. If you have questions, ask me the question as soon as you get them, because I know sometimes if we leave it to the last moment, um, then there's a big chance that we forget what we're about to ask. So yeah, use the Q&A, ask me questions, and I'll answer them, them as soon as I can. All right, guys, so let's get things going these are the topics we're going to talk about today and yes <clears throat> so um even if you don't have kids um probably you've heard i think it's a common sense that when a, um, an infant okay reaches the first year of age they start talking so after 12 months what are we going to have uh, from their infants or from babies or whatever they're going to start talking right that's kind of like a common sense even if you don't have kids yeah but what's so important here the important part is that they start talking in an attempt to manipulate our attention all right they want to manipulate our attention and why is this so important it's so important because we tend to imagine we tend to think that um, infants they they want to learn words because they are fascinated by words. Well, we might we may have some cases in which infants are fascinated by words, but uh, that's not their priority. Their priority is manipulate our attention. All right, and <clears throat> what we can we can call that as a behavior. All right, we can call that some sort of behavior, a communicative behavior. All right, language or this little guy here, language is secondary, is not the ultimate goal. Rudy, really? Yes, really, really, okay? And the whole thing behind um, this purpose of, okay, I wanna, I, I'm gonna learn uh, a way, I'm gonna try to find a way in order to manipulate uh, adults' attention, um, that requires reasoning. Yes, reasoning. And if we have reasoning, this means that our cognitive skills are activated. Our cognitive skills are activated because reasoning, thinking upon things or developing a strategy, whatever you want to call it, this is an activation of our higher order function skills. Okay. So for example, um, an infant or a baby, um, uh, they are going to basically analyze the entire situation, everything that's going on, associate all these things that uh, are going on in the environment to the language that's being used, uh, used, and the infant is going to develop schemas, okay? Develop schemas 
or if we're gonna, I'm going to use this word a lot, they are going to develop conceptualizations. What are conceptualizations? Conceptualization is basically um, the, uh, the description of everything that we have in the world, in the environment. So for example, I know uh, you're going to find me on YouTube and you're going to see I have a mug here, okay? my own mug. And what is a mug? A mug is a cylindrical recipient. Uh, there's um, um, a handle and it's made of ceramics. All right. So this is pretty much the schema that we develop for mugs. And this is kind of like uh, uh, an example of what a schema is all about. Okay. And why do they develop these schemas? They develop these schemas based on the language and the association and all these things. And um, before we know it, they are going to understand how these associ associations work. They are going to say, oh, every time a person says something, this happens. We have a consequence. I have, there is a consequence. Or because we're talking about now a, an infant that's learning how to speak, every time I produce this word for this noise, because for them, they have no idea what a word is. So every time I produce this noise, I receive something. I get any kind of benefit, right? Okay, so that's pretty much what happens at the first year of age, okay? If I'm going too fast, just let me know, and I can slow down a little bit as well. It's because I'm worried about talking about all these things in time and still have some minutes for the Q&A in case you have a Q&A. All right, so um, during the um, um, early stages of language acquisition, all right, um, we have some skills that um, kids or young kids actually can make use of, all right? They have a lot of skills, but there are certain skills that they haven't developed yet. I'm talking about when they are around uh, from, okay, let's say from one to five years old, all right? Very young kids, infants, all right? These are some of the activities, uh, sorry, these are some of the skills that they haven't developed when they're super young. They can express, they can't express accurately, okay? They can't express themselves accurately. And this is a cognitive skill. Express yourself accurately is a cognitive skill. Fully access perspectives. That's a cognitive skill as well. They can't fully access perspectives. All right. When I say fully access perspectives, I'm talking about, um, for example, putting themselves in the shoes of the other. That, that's hard for them. This kind of perspective I'm talking about. Not only physical perspectives, physical perspectives as well but also this kind of thing, because this is a cognitive skill that hasn't developed yet when they're super young. They actually, they also can't fully understand viewpoints, points of view, and that's a communicative skill. They can't understand, fully, fully understand viewpoints. And this is really important, all right? Fully understand. That doesn't mean that they don't understand anything. No, they do. They do understand certain things, but not completely. And the last one, they can't control their language. They can't control their language. And that's, of course, it's a, it's a linguistic skill. All right. <clears throat> and why? Because they are not cognitively mature yet. They're not cognitively mature yet. So what do they do then in order to communicate? So in order for them to communicate, they are going to try to uh, compensate for all these skills, oops, go back here, get out of there, nice. So they're, they're gonna try to compensate for these skills that haven't developed yet. So what are they gonna do? Well, they'll try to combine, for example, um, the, some of the cognit uh, uh, communicative skills that they possess with uh, some other incomplete skills, and they're gonna try to use uh, their repertoire that has just started to be developed. So that's what they'll do when they try to communicate. That's why sometimes 
Uh, it's so hard to understand when they talk to us, when they try to communicate with us. It's not only because they, oh, I, they, they can't, phonologically speaking, they cannot pronounce certain words very well. And what? No, because sometimes they say things that don't make sense, for example. And why do they don't make sense? Because, first, they can't express themselves accurately, all right? They can't control the language. They, well, understand viewpoints is more when they are exposed to the language and they can't fully access perspectives. Again, it's related to, very related to the first one, express themselves accurately. So that's why sometimes they say things and we're like, what are you talking about? I didn't get it. It doesn't make any sense. All right. Um, I don't know about you, but I think these are some characteristics um, that we find in A1 students. Yes, I don't know if you've ever uh, thought about this, but A1 students have similar characteristics. When I say similar characteristics, why? Because of course they can't express themselves accurately, but not because they have cognitive skills that are not developed yet, but more linked to the language, all right? They cannot combine the language with their, uh, their feelings. Their feelings are great. Their schemas are perfect. Their conceptualizations are perfect, intact. But then the language gets everything confused, all right? They can't, A1 students, they can't fully understand viewpoints. They can't, they can't, A1 students, all right? So yeah, very, very similar to A1 students, all right? Now, let's imagine the following situation. Um, imagine that there is an infant in the room and a parent in the room, in the kitchen. A parent's in the kitchen. There is an infant or a baby in the kitchen as well. And the parent is organizing the groceries. The parents are organizing the groceries. They ju they've just uh, returned from the grocery store or the supermarket or whatever. And the parent is organizing the groceries. And uh, as this parent is speaking up the cereal box, putting on the top shelf, like this image, putting on the top shelf, putting the box of cereals on the top shelf, this parent says, let's put the cereal up here. Let's put the cereal up here. Okay, I'm going to repeat the scenario. A baby is in the kitchen, a parent's in the kitchen, the baby's there paying attention to everything that's going on around, uh, around him or her, and the parent, as the parent is organizing the groceries, the parent gets the cereal box and says, let's put the cereal up here as the parent is doing that. Okay, so that's the scenario. Um, what we're going to have here is a great, is, is a beautiful, I'd say beautiful consequence. What's the consequence? What's the result that we're going to have? <coughs> the child is going, the child, the child's linguistic skill is going to be outlined by the action in association with the synthesis that are being produced. Meaning that, okay, um, we do, we have a child, that the, an infant, the infant is looking at the movement and then the movement in combination with the sentence that's being produced here. Let me just, here. The sentence that's being produced, that's what's going to outline the linguistic skill of that child. Okay, and how is that going to work? The baby is going to pay attention to two important things. The baby is going to pay attention to the action and actually three things. The action, the entity or the item, which is the cereal box, and in this case up here, the position. All right, the position, okay? 
That's the association that the baby is going to make. Because they're going to see like, okay, there is a gigantic person, adult, parent. There is this gigantic person. This gigantic person is doing something. And this something is being done using that item, the cereal. And up here means in that top position. That's the association that uh, uh, that's the association, the association that the baby is going to make when exposed to a situation like this overnight. No, of course, it's not going to be overnight. OK, it, it doesn't mean that one um, exposure to this scenario with that language, the baby is going to say, let's put the cereal up here. No, no, I'm not saying this. OK, I'm not saying this. Of course, we need to have frequent exposure to the entire situation, to this whole situation here. But the thing is, that's what's going to happen. The baby, they, they're not going to pay attention. Oh, this is a verb. Oh, this is a noun. Oh, this is a, um, um, I don't know, this is a uh, preposition. And uh, this is an adverb. This is a determ... No. No. For the baby, that doesn't matter. Okay? That doesn't matter. And one more thing. The order, we can't predict. We can't predict. Oh, we can predict what? We can predict whether the, the baby is going to um, make the first association uh, with cereal or if the first thing that they're going to associate is going to be up here or uh, uh, put the verb. We don't know. Okay? We have no idea. No idea. All right? No idea. But... Uh, this, um, <clears throat> again, this reasoning, this association that the baby is going to make between what's going on physically and linguistically, again, cognition, cognition all over the place. All right. Let me just see if this gets out of the way because it's in the, all right. Oops. Let's return one. All right. Now, okay, so these are the things that babies are exposed to. According to, this is, uh, these are data that I got from Michael Tomasello, uh, his book from 2005, from 2005, okay? Um, babies are exposed to about 7,000 utterances per day. 7,000 utterances a day. They're also exposed to about 25% of questions, meaning that 25% of the 7K utterances, 25% 25 are questions. 20% of the 7K aren't even false sentences. They're not false sentences. And about 25 of these 7K are imperatives. And only 15% respected the subject, verb, object um, uh, order, okay? Now, what do you think that kids are going to reproduce as they are learning how to talk, for example? Of course, they're gonna reproduce one of these things, maybe questions or maybe full sentences. When I say that they're in even full sentences, I'm talking about um, something like, uh, uh, okay, a full sentence, uh, 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 something, right? Right in, in English. In Portuguese, I do have it. It's so it's so cool. I, I have a two-year-old daughter. So um, as she's developing um, as a linguist, I studied this. I can't help but notice uh, the entire linguistic um, evolution of my daughter. And yeah, it happens. So um, one of the sentences that she, one of the sentences, no, but one of the utterances that she makes constantly, and it's not even a false sentence, is like, uh, uh, no, no, it's not a false sentence. It's just, no, she just says, no, not even a false sentence. All right. And imperatives, oof, all the time, all the time. And why? Because we, Adults 
expose them. We use imperatives a lot uh, when we're uh, um, engaging in communication with infants, for example. We do that because it's easier, much, much easier. Why am I going to use reported, uh, uh, why am I going to use uh, reported speech, for example, with, uh, with my daughter, with my two-year-old daughter? There's no reason why I should do that. So no, all right. So of course, uh, these are some of the uh, linguistic productions that we're gonna have uh, from babies because they are exposed to that according to Tomasello, they hear that. And of course, they are going, there's a big chance that they're going to reproduce one of these things that are here. And uh, one more time, they are not deliberately going to say, oh, I'm going to learn this word, all right? They're not gonna do that. I'm going to learn this word and all these things. No, 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 no. The cognition, their cognitive skill is going to be responsible for making those associations, uh, these associations, developing schemas. And why developing schemas and conceptualiza conceptualizing things are so important here? Because as they are exposed to this kind of language, and of course, a lot of um, actions and, and gestures and all these things, they're conceptualizing things, and uh, they're reasoning. They are making combinations, they are uh, selecting things, they are separating uh, things, and uh, yeah. And important thing, content words. What are content words? Verbs, nouns, adjectives. There's a big chance that these are the words that they are going to focus on the most, okay? The most, because they're more, they're more evident. They're more evident. And cognitively speaking, much easier for them to realize that because if I get a box of series and I say, let's put the box up here, of course, and again, not just once, but a lot of times, very frequently, I do things like that from box of series, from a box of cornflakes, from box of orange juices, from box and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They are going to start noticing like, wait a minute. So I think whenever this gigantic person is producing this box thing, this sound, this, uh, this gigantic person is referring to that item. Okay, got it. Okay, so all these, um, uh, all these activations, all these uh, uh, actions are cognitive actions, cognition, so to say. All right. And uh, what about complex? Because I said, oh, of course, imperatives are very easy and all these things. Yes, they're very easy. But what about complex sentences? Well, <clears throat> how do you do is a complex sentence, for example. Yeah. How do you do is a complex sentence. Why how do you do is a complex sentence? Because um, we don't normally say, for example, uh, how does she do? I'm saying, how do you do as in, how are you? How are you doing? And all these things. So how do you do as a greeting? Okay. Uh, we don't normally say, how does she do? We don't. We say, how do you do? But we don't say, how, do she, how does she do? So that's uh, in, uh, in linguistics, we consider that a complex construction. It's very complex, very complex. So again, this is to show you that um, the complexity the complexity of uh, the language um, is not based on the linguistic items. It's not based on uh, verb tenses and all these things, but it's based on um, uh, based on the relation that each of these items have among themselves and the conceptualizations that they are representing the mental representations that they are representing. I know it's uh, mental representations representing, that's not so cool, all right? But anyway, I think I made my point, all right? So yeah, that's weird, that's, comple that's complex. And <clears throat> again, that's why we're not gonna use all these things. That's why a baby, a, per a very young child is not gonna 
say, how do you do? How do you do? Or how does she do? And all these things. There, there's a big chance that, no, this is not going to happen because that is too complex and they're not mature yet. Their cognition is not fully uh, developed yet so that we can um, explore certain linguistic complexities. All right. <clears throat> and still talking about what infants hear, Tomasello, same study from 2005, uh, he said that 45% of maternal communication are items based. Item based. What are items? Uh, what are item based constructions? Item based constructions are those constructions that we have a pivot and based on that or a constant. Okay. And from that constant, you develop other sentences such as what? What is a constant? And then you have what a beautiful world. What a nice baby. What a great job. Um, what a good dog. So that's an item-based construction. And yes, according to Tomasello, 45% come uh, of uh, uh, language exposure come from this kind of construction. Oh, here, item-based. Okay, 45%. Now, uh, let's consider the uh, one of the principles of uh, neuroscience. Uh, one of the principles of neuroscience that we have is repetition is an ally in the learning process, right? So if, according to neuroscience, if repetition is, uh, is an ally, is something that's going to put, uh, um, optimize learning. I can say that there is a gigantic chance that babies are going to reproduce item-based constructions as well. Because look, if 45% of every communication is item-based, repetition, 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 repetition. So of course, then they're gonna say, what, a, what, and something. Maybe what a beautiful doggy and all these things. And these are very simple constructions, okay? Item ba this kind of item-based construction is super simple. So yeah, um, they can uh, easily, very easily um, do that, all right? Now, <clears throat> um, not so long ago, I think I published this for Giselle as well. I'm not so sure, but not so long ago, I wrote an article called, uh, Please Draw a House. And uh, in this article that I wrote, if I'm not wrong, I think I wrote, if I'm not wrong, I think I wrote for Blog of Giselle as well. There's also on my website, machaloconsultoria.com.br. You can find all my articles there as well. Uh, but I think I also, I also published, I collaborate with Giselle. I've collaborated with Giselle for so many times. But anyway, why did I write that article and why do I think this is really, really important? Because if I ask you guys, to draw, you don't have to do this right now, okay? But if I ask you guys to draw a house right now, and if I had a chance, an opportunity to compare each of your drawings with one another, we wouldn't have the same representation at all, at all. And why is that? Because internally in our minds, each one of us has a different mental representation for the same item, the same unit. Even for simple things such as house, we don't have the same mental representation. And uh, this is also why uh, having a child draw is so important because we are, um, we are exploring their mental representations, their conceptualizations. And maybe uh, m my re mental representation of a house is going to be super colorful, something similar to this illustration right here. Maybe, um, let's say that Karen, Karen from Mexico, maybe Karen's representation is going to be something completely different. Maybe it's not going to be as colorful, or maybe it's going to be even more colorful than my representation with more uh, details. So we don't have the same meant representation for the same thing. We do have some coincidences that makes uh, that make us understand each other. We do have some coincidences. We do have kind of like um, a core for what a house is all about, but we don't have the same mental representations. 
all right? And really, why are you saying this? Because this is what we do when we think of grammar. Because the first thing that uh, a lot of people think when I say the word grammar, oh, people say <coughs> grammar is pronoun, object, determiners. Not really. Grammar is the relation that the linguistic units have with one another. Pronoun, object, and all this, that's syntax, not grammar. Grammar is the relation that the units, and again, units represent mental representations, okay? Mental representations, that's grammar, the relation that these units have with one another. That's grammar, all right? Only in spoken or in spoken language. What about written text? That written discourse, the same, the same. Grammar is grammar, all right. And these constructions, of course, as I said, uh, we use these constructions to express our feelings, to express our viewpoints, to express um, uh, what's going on in front of us right now, to re to describe entities, to describe events, and all these things. We use language to, uh, to do that. And in order to do that, we need to find a relation between these linguistic units that represent or that symbolize our mental representations that we develop as we have, uh, as we're exposed to language and um, some uh, situational, uh, some situations. All right. Okay. Speech is not produced without a purpose. There is always a purpose. There's always a viewpoint. There's always a feeling. There's always something that a person wants to express. And what's so important here, something that we tend to forget as we, every time we talk about language acquisition or language teaching and all these things, the hearer. It's not only about the person that's speaking. It's also about the person. If a person is speaking, there's someone listening or there's someone hearing. And the hearer is just as important as the speaker. So these mental representations are super important. Why? Because if I'm expressing a viewpoint here, I'm doing it right now. I'm expressing a viewpoint. So I have to find ways, linguistic ways, I have to choose words carefully so that whenever my words follow the air and reach each of you, each one of you guys. You understand what I'm talking about. I'm manipulating your mental state right now. So, yes, and I have to choose carefully these words because I need to make sure that uh, the words that I'm using, the terms that I use, I'm using, the constructions that I'm producing, um, we share the same core. Okay? We share the same core. So, yeah, that's, that's super important. <clears throat> the hearer as well, <clears throat> okay? <clears throat> In uh, another scenario now, all right? Uh, you're at a dentist's office, and the dentist says, open wide. You're at a dentist's office, and the dentist says, open wide, okay? What's the first thing that we do when the dentist says open wide? Uh, mouth, right? Uh, I believe none of you uh, at a dentist's office and the dentist says open wide, I believe none of you would stretch your arms trying to hug the dentist. I don't think you would do that. All right. So um, we all have the same reaction uh, because this lexical combination of open wide here, uh, here, this le this combination open and wide, this uh, uh, this represents um, uh, an experience. This represents um, um, uh, an experience that we had. We've been to the dentist before. We know that whenever the dentist says or produces the combination open and wide, we know in our mind, it's as if we had um, an assistant in our mind and this assistant browses 
super fast. Oh, open wide. Boom. Oh, I have to do that. And then gives you the order to uh, open your mouth. Yes. Yes. The context. Of course, um, not only the context, okay? The context is the story. You at a dentist's office. But the combination open wide, okay, Marines? <clears throat> the combination of open and wide. All right? Open and wide. Not only the context, is the context and the combination open and wide. Because in this can be considered, of course, uh, just open wide, but we can consider that a meaningful chunk. It's a big chunk. Okay, big chunk. So the chunk open wide makes us access a mental representation that within a context, that's what we're going to have. Uh, open our mouths. All right. So in our minds, even in our minds as adults, of course, uh, we don't break it down. We're not going to break down open and wide. And the same phenomenon happens with the uh, collocation. Thank you. I don't know if you've ever had this experience before, but especially here in Brazil, I know that there is a person from Egypt, there is uh, uh, another person from Mexico. So here in Brazil, when we're teaching English as a second language, uh, it's happened to me so many times. But my students, Brazilian students, sometimes have a hard time uh, remembering that thank is a verb. And why do they struggle remembering that thank is a verb, to thank? Because it's so common to say, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's a big chunk. They don't break it down, thank and you. It's one big thing. And sometimes when they have to say, oh, my sister thanked me, they struggle. It's a simple construction. My sister thanked me, S-V-O. Super simple, super simple. All right. Um, the for the same as someone said something about uh, phone and email. Uh, can you can you elaborate, please, 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 please? Because uh, I uh, I didn't get it. Phone and and email, uh, Viviani. Please elaborate that on the chat box. I'm I'm curious right now. All right. So <clears throat> why am I saying this? Because again, these conceptualizations. It's a cognitive skill. They are a cognitive skill. And based on the interactions, the social interactions, that's what they're, these are uh, uh, the triggers for our social, uh, for our cognitive skills. The social, the social interaction is what's going to trigger these developments, all right? That's why you shouldn't break it down very, uh, break down the chunks. Not a good idea. And again, it's not even an idiom. It's not even uh, f people say, oh, phrasal verbs. It's not even that. Just a simple combination of open and wide. The same as thank you. So, no, not a good idea to break down. Okay? Explore the chunks. Chunks are super important. Okay? And then <laughs> I like to use this, uh, uh, um, this example here. We have... Um, uh, a jar lid factory, a lid factory jar, and a jar and jar factory lid. So we do have differences among these sentences. All right. And why do we have differences be among these sentences? So uh, jar lid factory, where the focus is on factory. Okay. Lid factory, lid factory jar. The focus is on factory again. And jar factory lid, the focus is on jar. All right, okay. But um, when we um, when we focus on these sentences, for example, we are going to see that jar is what? Is the adjective of lid, jar lid, okay? In the first one here, jar is the adjective. So, according to this, you're going to say, um, 
really, but um, I know, I got it. Look, jar itself is not an adjective. Jar is a noun. Okay, jar is a noun. So that's what I'm talking about. Like, oh, uh, the adjective, uh, the nouns, and uh, this is what's going to make grammar what grammar is all about. No, 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 no. Their relations. Because jar lid, jar, is not, a, it's not an adjective. It's working as a characteristic, and it's giving a characteristic for jar lid factory. Okay? Jar lid factory. And this whole combination, jar lid, is a characteristic for factory. See? We have three nouns. Three nouns. And they it's all about the mental representations, the conceptualizations that we have. Okay? Uh, yes, Christina, yes. Uh, the nouns performing as an act is an adjective. Yes, jar and lid. We have three nouns, but the only na uh, genuine noun that we have here is factory. So this is to help you guys understand that the schema, the conceptualization that we develop in our minds, that's what's so important. Rudy, are you saying that we shouldn't teach what an adjective is all about? Hmm. No, that's not what I'm not at all what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that uh, when we're teaching a second language, which I believe many of us uh, do that, have been doing this, uh, we can't forget that, oh, uh, this is a noun, this is an adjective, or uh, this is a past tense, or this is the present perfect tense, or uh, this is a subject. Maybe this is not going to be super effective. Why? We're going to see that the mental representation is much, much more important in this case. We need to ass assess our students' mental representations. All right? Mental representations. Okay, guys? <clears throat> now, let's keep going. Now, um, not so long ago, I talked about item-based constructions, all right? And that item-based constructions help in the schema formation, the conceptualization. It's easier to generate um, conceptualizations. It's easier to generalize because based on a common uh, unit, like what, you develop a lot of constructions. You can produce a lot, like what, uh, et cetera. All right, that's an item-based construction. So. Uh, What's the whole thing here? The whole thing is that we understand a constant, in this case, what? Get out of there. Let me just remove that. Come on. Yes. Ah, oh, I can't. It's too low. But anyway, so what, in this case here, as what a good doggy. All right. And uh, uh, then we're going to say, what a good doggy, what a good food, what a great boy, what a good girl. Again, item-based construction. So um, if we consider the um, relation that units have with one another, um, we are going to see that uh, it's going to be much easier to convey the message. Yeah. If you ask your students, what do you want to say? Even if they say it in Portuguese or in their native languages. Oh, I want to say, I want to praise my dog. Okay. What a good doggy. Oh, all right. And then you're going to, um, uh, you're going to expose your students again to another what a blah, blah, blah. What a blah, blah, blah. There will come a moment in which they'll say, all right, so from what a, I can construct a lot of things that can represent what's going on in my mind. Amazing. That's what I'll do. That's what I'll do. And then, yes, grammar. We have grammar. 
Simple as that. Simple as that. One more time. I know I said that a lot in the last almost 50 minutes. So, yeah. Grammar. The relations that units have with one another. Okay? The relations that units have with one another. In this selection of, um, uh, like, what or what a, is not going to be a random procedure at all, okay? It's a constant. So all the time, um, exposure after exposure, the person is uh, hears what a blah, 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 what a blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, um, the person is going to be like, okay, there is something, there's something important in this what a. Okay, there's something important. Um, but uh, again, context is also important. And uh, the culture. Culture is also very important in the selection of the words that are that we are going to use in order to represent what I'm talking what we're talk uh, what we are feeling. Uh, why? Because for example, a dentist, going back to the dentist slide. Uh, a dentist could have easily said something like, um, all right, patient, now please use your jaws to their full extension so that I can see your number 45. Because dentists, they refer to teeth as numbers. So they could have easily said that. But I believe that we wouldn't understand. So yeah, in this case, not only the context, but in this case, the culture is super important. Okay, so the selection of the words and the uh, relations that we have among them, so, um, among them, that's super important because they know that if they make this combination, the dentist is not going to manip is not gonna is not gonna access or make you access any mental representation that you may have in your mind, of course. All right, so no, not random at all. Okay. Now, uh, yes, of course, mental representations. Really, I got it. Um, what's so, what's so important about the mental representations here? <clears throat> um, we have this verb to tackle. Okay, and. Um, well, at least in Portuguese, we don't have this verb in Portuguese. We don't. We don't have this verb in Portuguese, okay? So, um, how are we going to do in this case? Because our students, they have no mental representation for it to tackle. Yeah. Well, yes, it, it may happen. And then, in this case, in the classroom, what we have to do, we have to use every resource that we have, every resource possible, paraphrase is one of the things. So you can use images, you can use uh, uh, GIFs, you can use um, um, short video clips. I don't know. Why? Because then we are going to help our students, even if they're adults. And why am I uh, emphasizing in even if they're adults? Because we assume that adults already have a lot of mental representations, a lot. Uh, this is one of the reasons why in certain cases, teaching adults are mu is much easier than teaching kids. But that's not the conversation for today. We, s we do have uh, pros and cons on both sides. This is a myth that, oh, kids learn faster than adults or better than adults. Adults don't learn. That's a myth, okay? But uh, this is one of the uh, advantages that's, that adults have. They have a lot of mental representations. But <clears throat> for this case to tackle... <clears throat> uh, uh, no, we don't have that. So we need to help our students develop that mental representation, that mental representation. And uh, um, yeah, it's complicated. It's complicated. But Rudy, um, can you give us another example? Uh, well, yes, I can. Uh, perfect tenses, okay? Uh don't we have the mental representation for the perfect tenses in English, at least in Portuguese? Yes, 
we do. But for some reason, for some reason, when we're teaching that tense in English, of course, for some reason, they don't access that. So if they don't access that, what do we do? Use, I'm going to tell you a secret. I'm going to spell, I'm going to say, it's, I'm going to whisper because it's a secret. Use L1. Use their native language. <gasps> really, Rudy? Yes, it's not a sin, guys. That doesn't mean that you're going to use, you're going to spend 90% of your class time um, only using their native languages. No, you're just going to use it so that they can access that mental representation. And then they're going to be like, oh, mental representation, I got it. Oh, language, I got it. And boom, they're going to make this connection. All right, they are going to do to make this connection. Of course, um, in the case of to tackle, we don't have that. So yeah, we can paraphrase. We can use every resource that's at our hands at the moment. But yeah, um, if they are, if for some reason they, you know, that they have that mental representation, but for some reason they're struggling assessing the mental representation, use their native language. It's not a sin. You can do that. You're going to do that for like two seconds, and then you're going to go back to the target language. Yeah. That's fine. That's okay, guys. That's okay. No problem. Okay? Yeah, time for Q&A. So to wrap up, guys, so uh, in this conversation today, uh, we saw how uh, language is responsible for the formation of conceptualizations, but not only language, a combination of social interaction and language or social yeah, well, I can say social interaction and language. This is what's going to help us uh, develop our concepts or help us conceptualize uh, things. And uh, we also saw that grammar is a conceptualization that uh, is a conceptualization that we develop using our cognitive skills and our social uh, in our linguistic skills. And we also saw that grammar is the uh, relation that the linguistic units have among themselves and not necessarily pronoun, subject, not all these things. These things are sent, uh, these things are syntax. What we're talking about grammar is completely different. Is the mental representation, the combination of mental representations that are uh, uh, symbolized in linguistic units. We saw that as well. We also saw that uh, Chunks are very important in second language acquisition because uh, they are not only in second language acquisition, but in language acquisition in general, because they are very frequent, they're very simple, we can generalize things, and from that we can expand to other situations. And if for some reason we are <clears throat> we are using uh, some linguistic units that are not accessing or that our students are struggling accessing the mental representations, well, then we either help them help them create, develop a mental representation, or <clears throat> uh, if we know that the mental representation is there because we know that in native in our in their native language it's the same or similar, use their native language and then for two seconds and then you start, you uh, resume uh, in the target language. There is no problem. All right, guys. So these are my references. These are some of the references that I used for this conversation today. Uh, I have the Bravska, uh, Pat's Alive Down, and Nina Spada, uh, Jurgen Meisel, and Michael Tomasello. Okay. And as I told you, you can find me on Facebook. Oh, yes, on Twitter as well. On Twitter is uh, at Machiello Console. Okay. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on YouTube. You can find me on Instagram. You can find me on, on Spotify. My name is Rudy Machiello, and thank you very much. If you do have questions, please use the chat box because I was talking a lot, and I know that you post a lot of stuff. I'm taking a look at what, uh, what you have to say. Okay. But I'm here. Let's, uh, I think we can still have, I don't know. Uh, a couple of minutes to interact. Come on, guys. Let's interact. Come on. <clears throat> thank you, Gina. Thank you so much. Yasmin, thank you. Sonia, thank you so much. 
Willie, thank you. Laura, thank you. Clayton, yeah. Marinez, all right. Jessica, Felipe, Analia, thank you so much. Teresa, George, Terezinha, Fabiana, Adriana, Fabiana, guys, thank you so, so much. Yes. Uh, Viviani also said, using L1 wisely helps us save a lot. Yes, it does, for sure. Comparison of language core according to Yes, definitely, Fabiana, definitely. Uh, and now, oh, okay, I've already mentioned that. Um, the comparison of language equivalent. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Viviani, please email me the report. Okay, now I got it. Okay, I got it. Yes, yes. Uh, item base would Brazil uh, the same as drills? Uh, what do you mean? The Brazilian item based? Uh, is this what you're talking about, Denise? Brazilian Brazilian item-based constructions? Well, item-based constructions work the same way. Well, I don't know every language that we have in the world on the planet, but um, in Portuguese, yeah, uh, because we do have something like quer ou quer o. Quero, quer ou quer a. Quer a comida, quer o colo, quer andar. So that's an item-based construction and super simple. It's a question. It's part of, of, of those, one of those uh, percentages that I, that I showed you in the very beginning of this conversation. And uh, uh, yes, it's going to work the same way because then they are going to reproduce this care and uh, an article or, or a determiner uh, in the same way as we do. And they are going to generalize that by using some of the... Uh, some of the words that maybe we don't use a lot, but they learn somewhere somewhere else. Uh, yeah, they're gonna work pretty much the same way. I don't know if this was your question, Denise. If it's if it wasn't, uh, please let me know. Uh, Gianna, thank you. No, thank you, guys. All right, that's okay. Thank you so much, so much. All right, to tackle a how do I diversify? That's the thing. Yes. Um, Elasir, all right, that's the point. But uh, agarrar um adversário, but then we say, okay, I gotta tackle this uh, issue first thing in the morning. We have a problem then, all right, we have a problem now, then. So, yeah, and again, agarrar um adversário, we have agarrar, and then a person can say, why don't you say agarrar, teacher, to um, hold. A person because it's not hold. So you see, we have nuances in to tackle, and that we don't have the same. That's why I said we don't have the same mental representation. Okay. All right. Uh Rosella, thank you. No, thank you. Luis Gustavo, thank you. Thank you so 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 much. Yes. Uh like abordar um assunto. Exactly, but then we're using abordar. You see, address in English. And then, oh, but teacher, we have address. Why are you using tackle? I didn't get it. All right. <clears throat> uh, Ephigenia from Sao Paulo. Okay. Hi, Ephigenia. Hello. Thank you so much for coming. What else? Do we have more questions? I think we can talk for like two more minutes. I don't know. I guess so. If you have time, I, can, I have maybe two. Three more minutes. If you have questions, I'm here. It's always so nice to talk to you guys. But once again, thank you. So, well, as you're uh, still asking me questions, so again, once again, guys, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'm really humbled by your your presence today. And Giselle, thank you so much for this invitation. It was wow. We're we're old friends, but uh, yeah, it was it was amazing. It was amazing. Yeah. Uh, Christina, you're from Paraguay. Wow. So cool. Denise, images to create mental representations. Um, it helps. All right. It helps. It helps create mental representations. Is, yes, for sure. But what if you're talking about something that you don't have an image to represent? Uh, let's say something like um, my, uh, my sister loves dogs. We don't have an image that really represents a person loving dogs. You can have a person, you can have an image uh, 
of a person um, holding a dog. You can have an image of a person petting a dog. You can have a per, uh, an image of a person running with a dog, happy face, but my sister a per, or uh, a person loving a dog. No, you, you don't. Okay. But yeah, yeah. And then what do you have to do? You actually have to provide as many um, resources as possible. So she's like, oh, why is she loving? Oh, yes, because you, and then you make, you make some, some analogies. Yeah, that's fine. But yeah, images for sure, for sure. Uh, all right, Julia, the tech problem when you guys, when you gave us your screen, I love the sound. Really? Really, really? Whoa. Um, was that, so basically, you couldn't hear the entire presentation, Juliet, because my screen, I was sharing my screen the entire presentation. Oh, well, guys, Juliet said that she couldn't hear me the entire presentation while I was sharing the screen. Uh, did any of you guys have the same problem? Please let me know. I, I Juliet, did, did you say that? Did you say that before? If you said that before, Juliet, I'm so, so sorry. I didn't, I didn't see that. I'm so, so sorry for that. Wow. Um, abstract thing too. Uh, uh, yes, yes. <clears throat> uh, when I say abstract things, uh, I'm uh, not necessarily uh, uh, feelings, um, but uh, things that we can't, that can't be represented easily. All right. Maybe it's not an abstract, maybe an abstract thing. But yeah, you're right, Marina. Yes, abstract uh, entities. Uh, or things are much harder to to represent. Uh, all right. Oh, I'm so sorry, Juliet. Really, really sorry. Oh my goodness. Uh, I'll I'll uh, I'll tell them. And uh, I really, uh, I'm so sorry. I I I really don't know what to tell you for real. I'm so sorry. All right. Uh, yes, it's it's being recorded. Yes, yes, <clears throat> yes. Well, uh, great reminder, uh, Juliet. I'm gonna see if uh, those guys from Dizal have the recording. If the, I think on Facebook, if you go to Dizal's page on fa a Facebook page, I think uh, there there are some people following us on Facebook. If I'm not wrong, or this recording is gonna be available on on their Facebook page. Take a look at Dizal's Facebook page. All right. And uh, if you still uh, can't have access to the entire uh, presentation today, uh, just let me know. You have my contacts. So let me know, and then I'll try to contact this out and see if I can help you. Okay? All right. Okay. So, guys, uh, seriously, thank you so much. If you still have some questions, but we're running out of time, you know where to find me. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, at much yellow console double t double l you can find me on youtube um you can post comments uh, there are so many videos out there uh you can find us on spotify as well with shop pedagogical with me and andre helland uh, you can find me on instagram at much yellow consultoria again double t double l like my name i don't know if you can see my name here uh double t double l you can find me on facebook as well uh much yellow consultoria or find me on facebook uh rodolfo machiello find me and i'm gonna be super super happy to uh have a conversation with you guys and yeah yeah if for some if you guys uh 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 took a screenshot of that and you're gonna post this on instagram just uh tag us yeah tag machelo consultoria it's gonna be super cool to see you guys there so once again thank you so much really appreciate it i hope you had as such as a great time as i did Bye-bye, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.